heard in the power of love. Amen. Please be seated. So, St. Michael and all angels, a time when we stop and think about things that are mostly perhaps on the edges of our spiritual imagination. And yet, every time we gather for Eucharist, we affirm that we're gathering not just as a group of people here, but we say that we're gathering with angels and archangels with all the company of heaven. And indeed, if we were a Greek Orthodox Church, or indeed any Orthodox Church from the eastern part of Christianity, the walls of the church and the ceiling of the church would be completely covered in beautiful mosaics. So as you step inside the church, you are surrounded by images, paintings, mosaics of the great saints and angels from the biblical story and the story of faith since the time of the Bible. So today on the Feast of St. Michael and all angels, which happens to be for us this year, the final Sunday in the season of creation, we pause to think about what we mean when we say, and so with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name. After all, do we really believe in angels? And if we do believe in angels, what do we believe about them? When we go back into the scriptures to see what the Bible tells us about angels, it's a fairly diverse kind of set of materials. Angels are there, but they're not central to the story, although there are points in the story where they become highly significant. The Hebrew word for, Hebrew word for angel is just simply the word messenger. Okay? messenger. And guess what? They don't have wings. They don't have feathers. And usually I guess they're not dressed in white, um, white flowing robes. What are these three messengers up to? You're checking the fans or something? I think there's smoke. I didn't call down, I didn't arrange for fire and brimstone today. It could just be that these fans get smoking. Here, the wicks haven't been trimmed and they're putting off a lot of black smoke. Had a similar problem at St. Thomas's last week. I could barely see the corrugation because the church was so full of thick smoke from the over eager candles. So, we find that the Bible does talk about angels, and nine times out of ten, when somebody is engaging with an angel, they have no idea it's an angel they're dealing with. It's only towards the end of the story that something gives away, that this was not just a stranger who happened to pop in and strike up a conversation, this was a messenger who had come from God. In fact, one of the most common phrases for angel in both the Old Testament and the New Testament is the phrase, the angel of the Lord, which nine times out of ten means the Lord. Okay, it's just that they were so had become so devout, so careful to avoid misusing the name of God that they wouldn't even say God was there. They'd say it was an angel of God who'd come to speak to them. Same kind of thing happens in the New Testament, but now we get the word we kind of recognise, the word angelos, from which we get uh, angel, not Anglican. Okay? Angelos, again, it just means messenger. And as we heard in that first hymn, there's a huge vocabulary of spiritual entities, including the cherubim and the seraphim, and a whole cast of non-human spirits and demons. And the difference between a spirit and a demon simply seems to be whose team are they on. And as, as Jewish thought develops through the Persian period and into the Greek Hellenistic period, we find a stronger sense of the world being divided between good and evil, between light and dark, and the angels themselves being divided into two teams, sort of like a grand final, okay? Two teams of warriors, one team 
on God's side and the other on the side of the devil, Satan, whatever symbol we use for that power. Indeed, when we get to the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were only discovered again in 1948, but basically come from the time of Jesus and a century or so before the time of Jesus, we find a whole host, and that's a great word, isn't it, for angels, a whole host of good and bad powers, spiritual powers. And they're divided between those who are, who are, who are aligned with light and those who are aligned with darkness. The king or the leader of the forces of light is a fellow sometimes called Melchizedek, which is just an almost unpronounceable Hebrew word that means king of justice, king of righteousness, if you like. Melchizedek. We'll hear about him, by the way, in the next few Sundays when we start having readings from the letter to the Hebrews. And guess what? Opposite Melchi, sorry, opposite Melchizedek, like Darth Vader in Star Wars, there was Melchi Resha. And Resh means yuck or evil. So you had Melchizedek, the king of good, and Melchi Resha, the king of all things nasty. And as we saw in the reading today from the book of Revelation, there were these beliefs around that there was this incredible spiritual conflict in the heavenly places, as Paul would say, between the forces of evil and the forces of good. And that that struggle is reflected in our own struggle to do and to live properly. And of course, they, um, as we always do, we found some good names for the other side, didn't we? So the, the devil becomes that great dragon, that serpent, the deceiver of the whole world. But not only did the angels not have wings, but in the Bible itself, the other side don't have dragon-like body parts either. These are vivid symbols for good and evil. The famous scene of St George slaying the dragon, which comes from a much later tradition after the time of the Bible, is itself a variant of the reading we heard about from Revelation 12 and it probably it's part of a tradition in the ancient world that goes back to the ancient stories about conflict between the farmer or the villager with their rice paddy and their irrigated fields and the crocodile, the dragon, the enemy of civilization. So that's the ancient world, that's the kind of understanding of good and evil and of powers beyond the human realm that we will find just taken for granted throughout the biblical story. It gets more complicated in some bits and less complicated in others. In our world, we think we've shown the angels the door, right? We can now explain so much of the cosmos as well as the inner workings of the human person, whether we're talking physical or whether we're talking psychological. And we're grateful for the advances in science and human knowledge, which allow medicine and space travel and even iPhones and live streaming of our church services. These are all gifts that we enjoy because we've done so well at understanding how the universe ticks. And so some people think the universe has been deprived of its angels, but perhaps not. When I first met Eve, my wife, on the door of her fridge, and it's still on the door of our fridge, even though the fridge is not the same one, there was a little fridge magnet with these words. Every blade of grass has an angel that bends over it and whispers, grow, grow. Wouldn't it be nice if that were true? It's a lovely sentiment that the world, in a sense, is enchanted. 
and that all around us, even down to the tiniest blade of grass, there is a messenger of God bending over and whispering, grow, grow. The saying is attributed to the Talmud, and the Talmud, which makes it sound impressive, and the Talmud is a collection of Jewish theological wisdom finished around about 500 AD, so 1500 years ago, roughly, and a few other later, later bits added as time went by. You'll find that little fridge bag quote all over the internet if you just do a quick Google search. And they all say it comes from the Talmud. But when we go looking in the Talmud, you won't find it. Hmm. Don't trust the internet when doing a school essay or indeed a university essay. What you will find is a similar saying, but it's a little bit more interesting. This is from the commentary on the, on the creation story in Genesis from Burashid Rabah. Uh, so it's the big commentary on creation. It reads like this. Ben Sirah, in other words, the son of Sirah, said in his commentary, God caused herbs to spring forth from the earth, and with them the physician heals the wound, and the apothecary compounds his preparations. Rabbi Shimon said, there is not a single herb but has a matzal, a constellation in the heavens, which strikes it and says, grow. Hmm. So we can sort of see where the fridge magnet has come from, but it's a little bit more complex in the original version in the Talmud. It preserves the idea that growth here in this life may be helped or hindered by extraterrestrial powers sent by God, but on the other hand, striking is a rather more severe form of encouragement than whispering, whispering. I really like the idea of angels whispering rather than um, a heavenly constellation thumping me with some kind of instrument. But we see the point. What this fridge magnet and what this saying from the Talmud is telling us is that God is everywhere throughout creation. And God and God's messengers are constantly poking us, provoking us, encouraging us, disciplining us, shaping us to become the creatures God wants us to be. So maybe the world has not lost its angels, just we've not got out of the habit of looking for them. We've begun to lose the sense of enchantment and so maybe re-enchantment of this amazing universe that we now understand better than any other time in human history and yet have only begun to really understand. Maybe re-enchantment is the spiritual project for our times. Maybe what we most need to do as church is to help people imagine that the world is enchanted, that God is everywhere, that God is involved in every aspect of our life, rather than imagining the world as a mechanistic system driven by chemicals that shape our moods. Indeed, a, a book that I really loved, um, I remember reading it when I was still a student at Theological College, I used the phrase that the mission of the church was to keep alive the rumour of angels. Okay. In other words, there's more to life than what we see. And we're inviting people to look again, to look more deeply, to look with eyes of faith, and to see that God is all around us. And these messengers are simply expressions of God all around us, every day, in every situation. And we are, I think, in, the, in this stage of modernity, we're beginning to move beyond that mechanistic explanation of reality 
And I think people are more and more inclined to embrace the idea that the universe, the world, is both an expression of cosmic energy, what people of faith call God's love, and it is also a dynamic process that responds to our attention or responds to our lack of attention. And during this season of creation, that's one of the things we've been encouraged to, to embrace and to imagine, that we are part of the whole and the whole is interacting with us all the time. So on this final Sunday in the season of creation, which also happens to be the Feast of St. Michael and All Angels, we're invited to widen our concepts of God's creation, to include everything we know and understand, as well as everything else which we are yet to discover, are yet to explore, explore and certainly do not yet understand. Angels and archangels, along with the cherubim and the seraphim, are symbols of the God who speaks to us out of the depth dimension of life, the constant loving presence of God in and through everything. There is no place, there is no circumstance in our life where the angel of the Lord cannot bend over us and whisper, you are blessed, you are loved, grow, flourish, become who we intend you to be. Call them by any name you wish, but these expressions of cosmic love, divine love, are profound and powerful. Amen.